Trey, did you get a new Zoom background there? <laughs> yeah, uh, not really, though. I, I'm actually up north because in Michigan, you either have to leave for a little bit in the winter or you have to really take advantage of northern Michigan. And so I'm up skiing today with uh, Dr. Jim Hilker, of all people. Um, really taking this whole we've got a big fancy guest on thing really seriously, man. Thanks, bud. Well, I'm just saying, man, <laughs> there, there are fewer people around me right now than there were at home. So this is, uh, this is wonderful. It's <laughs> sorry, Jonathan, but this is also awesome. No, no, I, I actually, I think I'm honored by this. This will be the first and maybe only time I've been interviewed from this, from somebody ski on a ski uh, slope <laughs> or just come off a ski slope. And this feels like a whole new world for my, uh, my boring policy discussions. <laughs> it's, this is going to be different than your boring policy discussions. I promise. <laughs> Well, Trey, why don't you stop bragging about having fun and tell us who we're talking to this week? Well, I'm not the lawyer in the room. I'm, I'm the only, I'm the odd man out right now. Uh, You're the odd but, man out in most circles. Well, <laughs> that's not wrong. Uh, the, uh, so we've got um, Jonathan Coppas, who is, uh, I mean, I don't even know where you begin to describe how you are connected into ag policy. Uh, I would probably say that for anybody who's paid attention to me talking about uh, the future of ag policy, you wrote or co-authored one of the pieces that I always talk about, the, the changes in ad hoc payments. Um, but also you worked in the FSA for years. So you worked with Vilsack, so you know what that relationship's like. Uh, but you also just recently served on that Biden transition team, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm I mean, a glutton like... for punishment there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's a professor big fancy professor working on kind of the farm doc stuff at Illinois. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. I'm on the, I'm the oddball lawyer, one of the oddball lawyers on a, on a, in a faculty of economists. And so I always joke, I'm, I'm just there for them to both make fun of me and then to argue, have somebody to argue with. So <laughs> that's what I'm good for. Now it's well, great. To, it's great to meet you guys and, uh, and to be yeah. on this. So this, this is good. So well, welcome while to Closing you're... Bell, which is going to be a fundamentally different conversation than I think you've had in a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we should probably start with the uh, crazy year we're having, right? Uh, <laughs> so I mean, which one, right? right are, are, we, are we still counting uh, this as 2020 so we can, yeah, we can like dump all the bad into 2020 and not, if not only. have to carry this over? <laughs> so you're in Illinois, but you've been doing a lot with DC right now, right? Is, yeah, is that yeah. role kind of a continuation of what you were doing with FSA or is this a completely different ballgame? No, nah, this is a completely different ballgame. And you guys can sort of appreciate the, the oddities of these things. I got to, you know, all my past uh, sins come back to haunt me by uh, I got a phone call back in early fall saying, hey, if, you know, if the election goes well, we're going to need a transition team. You willing to do it? I said, oh, sure. What the, what the hell? Why not? Right. And we. So I, it was a volunteer effort uh, that basically consumed my life for two and a half months, um, as such volunteer efforts can tend to yeah. be. <laughs> uh, and we uh, and we did it all virtually. So I didn't even have to go out to DC. We sat here and did it uh, on Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after Google meeting after what was the other one? Microsoft Teams. I don't know. Pick your pick. It's your, the worst. Uh, Teams is the worst. Uh, Teams is bad. They really got to work on that. So okay, so you step into this role. And uh, honestly, like, like on that Biden transition team, you were the one name that like, I immediately knew the rest, rest of them, I kind of had to do a little Google searching. Did you feel like, like there was a lot of representation of agriculture at that table or? Yeah. I mean, you try to run, like the transition thing is pretty lean and mean. So you mm -hmm. kind of had one person from, you know, a different set of, you didn't do quite missionary by missionary for USDA, uh, but it was sort of like topical area. So um you know, we, we had a good cross perspective, if you will, of the issues mm -hmm. that, U that USDA deals with and, um, and kind of the, the topical areas that, that we had. And, and again, it's, it is a temporary, it is just, it's one of the oddest things. Like if you just think about any kind of effort, right, it's perfect government and that it's very short term and you just sort of disappear. Like my email and everything for transition turned off at five o'clock. Mm. Uh, uh the day of the inauguration and like gone oh, wow. everything everything was done so huh. but i still don't um, even know done. really what it what you do in the transition team what what were y'all doing yeah so it's um i don't want to i don't want to you know ruin my reputation with you guys on the first go around but it was 
is far less glamorous than one might assume. It it's seems like, pretty fancy, dude. I mean, it's super glamorous. So <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it's far, far less. <laughs> so agent transition is a big, a big beast of an undertaking because you've got, you know, you're you're switching out the entire political leadership of the federal government. So it's kind of if you just step back and geek out a little bit about how government works, like it's one of those just phenomenal things because at noon on the 20th, the entire political leadership goes out the door and a whole new set of leadership has to come in. And you can imagine how cold, you know, you could run in cold and blind and something like that. So this transition is this sort of just handoff kind of uh, effort. What we were doing specific, and it's, it's a beast, like you've got everything from, you know, every agency has agency reviews, which is, which is what I was on. You have entire personnel aspects, you have entire, you know, the White House has its own, all the little offices in there. And so it's just a big beast. The agency review side is, like I said, less glamorous than maybe some because it's, it's very mechanical sort of functional. We're in there just running through budgets and personnel ceilings and you know, what's the state of regulations? Where, where do things fit on the schedule? Do we got to review? Does a new team need to review these things? And so it's just a lot of that kind of functional bits. Uh, it, in, you know, in times of old, it would have been, uh, or in the before time, before everything was virtual and whatnot, we'd have been plunked down in a probably a basement room in the South building at USDA and go meeting after meeting. And, you know, you'd have prepared these, these big binders to hand to the political team. This year it was all virtual and we handed off, uh, you know, uh, an entire probably gigabyte of Google stuff, Google documents and PowerPoint presentations and things like that. And the whole idea is just, here's the state of the agency. Here's, here's where everything kind of stands. So on day one at noon, when, when the new political team walks in, they've got kind of a roadmap and a what, but okay, are. so so one one thing that everybody talks about is how this feels like a different transition than the usual. Um, and uh, did that transition like like to me? People talk about it like almost the sky is falling. Like all of a sudden, policy is going to change, and and we're like stepping into this whole complete unknown. Like like if if you're trying to lay the groundwork for what to expect, was that the 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 punchline? Or or so it was. Is, it, yeah, it is, was definitely a, a different transition. There. Yeah. Yeah, there's so some people will work themselves into a frenzy um, over the unknown. And most, it's like, look, this, the entire career staff stays the same. That's you what know, I was going to ask. Professional public like just... servants. Yeah. It's only the political leadership. The lights stay on. The thing still functions. Um, so it is not like you're not switching out everybody, right? This isn't the days of old when patronage would fill the halls. Like this is just, this is just political leadership. And uh, from my experience, you know, political leadership is, is obviously very important, but it doesn't, nothing changes overnight. And so nothing's really, you know, you don't just have a complete undoing, but there will be significant changes in direction for policy and, and, and the things they want to do. Um, and Trey, to your point, like it, it was a very different transition because it was all virtual. Um, it was very different uh, in addition to that because the outgoing president refused to concede. And so for a month, we were, we were sort of hung up in this bardo of, uh, well, we do not have ascertainment, so we can't talk to the agencies. We, it was just mess, right? It was just a sort of weird state. Um, but once the GSA finally sign the letter and then we could all officially meet with the agencies then we just crammed into like the next month uh uh what we're we're literally like 12 hour days of meetings um and just just buzzing through you know documents and uh budgets and things like that and i mean i feel i feel like that it, despite all of that we still got a pretty good work product i think we got a really good work product in our agency review we got a good sense of where things stood um, you know, there's a lot of big questions. Okay. Okay. So where do, where do you think stand? Uh, because I like, we have all these ad hoc payments. We yeah, have these like, so, like, uh, like unprecedented, like trade conflicts that we have to figure out. Like, like where, where are things? So it was, so the big questions are exactly that. Like the COVID, how the agencies have survived COVID pretty, pretty well. I mean, I, you know, I think we got a lot of field staff and places like FSA who have been pushed to the brink of, you know, their workloads, you got a lot of people stressed out just trying to, to manage that. But overall, uh, pretty, pretty well. Um, 
these all these trade payments. I mean, the the previous administration in the last couple of years has pushed out more than forty billion dollars in additional payments, which is just mind boggling to begin with. And uh, you got to give a lot of credit to the public servants in that agency that that pulled it together and got those payments out. You know, a lot of it's automated. I mean, we you know these these aren't the days of of putting checks in the mail. It's, it's, uh, it's a deposit, direct deposit for the most part. Um, but the signups get really tricky and challenging with that kind of, you know, MF8, MFP 18, then 19, then CFAP 1 and CFAP 2. They were very, di every one of those were incredibly different programs in, in key ways, different crops, different farmers coming through the door. So the agencies, particularly the field staff have been pushed to the brink, I would say of just what is, you know, your tolerance level for, for, uh, for doing things. Well, not, not to mention, obviously, ERS is kind of in a weird place. And so like, like the support there is, is kind of in a strange moment. Um, but, but let's, you said CFAP, let's, let's talk like, that's, that's the current concern, right? That, that the Biden administration has paused CFAP payments. Um, what, what can you say about that is. <laughs> so I, from a, from, a, from a big picture point of view, this, the previous administration made just a very creative and unique use of the Commodity Credit Corporation and the authorities to make payments. Let, let me just lay that out there. This is a whole new environment. Um, and, and I've said this in multiple sort of discussions, like I don't know where this puts policy going forward. You can't move that kind of money in that short of time in that way in the policy world not adapt and adopt around it, right? Like something is going to change. We just don't know what and how it looks coming out of it. Um, to your specific point on, on CFAP, you know, I don't think it's too unusual for a new administration to put a pause on things and, and review and reevaluate. Um, and particularly in light of just the unusual nature of what we saw go out. And there were a lot of questions raised on the Hill from Congress. Uh, GAO put out a report on the 2019 uh, MFP that raised a lot of questions about how these were designed, how payments were distributed. You know, there's been some great academic work. Uh, my colleague Joe Jansen here has done some really good work on MFP about are we even really, are there, are there damages and losses to this degree and this level, right? So are we really even talking about a payment system? Um, for, for an economic loss or damage. And so there's a lot of questions. So I don't think it's a big reason to get concerned. I mean, I think the new administration's right to re, just hit pause and reevaluate everything because they now own it. So whatever goes out the door now is on their watch. And so I think, you know, that's a pretty standard kind of best practice um, aspect of it. Do you, do you have a sense though of, of what's, likely to happen beyond that pause? I don't, because I don't know what they're going to review. I mean, one of the challenges of any transition, but magnified in the one we were in with the virtual situation and, and the delay and everything, is there's only so much you can know until you're actually on the ground in the, in the offices and, and working through things. There's only, there's just, there's a limit on what you can do in a short amount of time, but, you know, uh, there's only so much you're going to learn in that process. So I think it's hard to say from the transition standpoint what they'll what they'll uncover or what they may see and how that changes it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Okay, what, what uh, about, so you mentioned the CCC. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm starting to read things about uh, maybe like carbon credits or, or some type of carbon markets. Do, do you have any, any sense of, obviously we're in uncharted waters with CCC. <laughs> Um, so, so is that how this is going to happen? Is this going to happen? You know, I mean, we're, we're starting to get kind of uh, stakeholder questions about like, how, how do I even participate in this market? Is this even a market or is this a thing people are talking about, you know? So, yeah. So I think without a doubt, I mean, President Biden, when he was campaigning, was very clear that climate change was going to be a, a real priority and that USDA and agriculture had a real and valuable and important role to play in it. And so I do think you will see and I, I think I can say this without getting myself in trouble. Um, you know, we reviewed closely the CCC and authorities and how it was used and, and we're able to sort of package up recommendations or, um, you know, some sort of roadmaps around it. Um, I think the way the previous, that, that's the, you know, my own two cents on this. 
that the, the way the previous administration uh, used the CCC it kind of sets a precedent for a lot of flexibility. Um, so I think the new administration has a lot of flexibility in what they can do. Uh, biggest limits are things like the borrowing authority cap of 30 billion. And it doesn't, it sounds like a lot of money, uh, but, but in terms of running these sort of programs on a national scope and scale, um, you know, you can, you can get in trouble under borrowing authority pretty quick. And you got to remember the CCC is what we pay everything. For. So conservation programs, Title I programs, all of that going out the door has to be covered, is covered by the CCC. So that borrowing authority, borrowing authority, you always have to watch out for. Um, what I would like to, you know, in my sort of, and this, this probably gets me into, you know, sort of geek land a little bit. I see an opportunity and nothing I saw in transition changes this perspective. I kind of took this in, I, I came out with a very similar opinion. I see an opportunity here um, for this administration, for the USDA team to, to get creative around uh, carbon and CCC and, and the variety of, I mean, just think about the number of different authorities and programs that, that exist uh, for farmers in the conservation space, in uh, Title I space, even crop insurance. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for them to, to pilot some things, uh, to maybe get some ideas out and test them out and see, you know, what, 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 is a, what does a farmer response look like to this type of program? Uh, does it develop, does it help stand up or boost the market, right? Which is kind of one of your basic CCC authorities is, is sort of market development. And then ideally what you'd want to see is a pretty close working relationship between USDA's attempt to pilot some things and test some ideas out and feedback that into Congress and the, and the Senate and House Ag Committees. Uh, you know, a, a senator you guys may have heard of uh, who happens to be chair of the Senate Ag Committee is also a very, very big proponent of carbon and climate work on agriculture right. and conservation. And so Chairwoman Stabenow, one of my former bosses. Um, and, and Chair, oh, I didn't know that. But I, yeah, the, that was her, the uh, Stabenow connection counsel. is really interesting because, I mean, you also touch on more uncertainty, right? Like those, those committees are going to look completely different aside, aside from really the Stabenow link. But I mean, Pat Roberts is gone. <laughs> so, so like, you know, what, what does that even look like? You know, uh, I, so it's, try, it's that's hard a working whole... in extension right now because it's, there's just a lot of uncertainty from our side. Uh, Trey, I mean, that's a whole, we might have to do a whole nother session on, on <laughs> the post Pat Roberts, post uh, Colin Peterson ag committee environment, because holy, you're talking about the, the, between the two of them, they were on every farm bill back into the yeah. 80s. So, <laughs> yeah. but I tell you, I mean, and, and again, you know, I worked for, for Chairwoman Stabenow on the 14 farm bill. Um, I have the utmost respect. You want to talk about the, just a, an outstanding legislator. And like, so she's, I, I would say we're in good hands, agricultural wise, um, even, even though, you know, we've, you've lost some of that institutional knowledge with Roberts and, and Peterson. But this is where she, you know, this is where her sort of ability to look through this and work through these issues uh, with somebody like Secretary Vilsack, both of them have a lot of experience, a lot of leadership in this. And that's where I, I have this sort of optimism that you can try some things out and she'll be very focus on what those things look like and what does it mean on the ground and then work to translate that maybe into some more permanent programs in the 2023 farm bill space or even sooner if congress starts to move on climate uh, legislation so there's a lot of really fascinating opportunities um so i kind of push back on anybody that's worried about things I'm like this isn't don't be worried i'm this worried time i'm to worried get, about to things <laughs> <laughs> i'm worried about things i just want to your you use some clever legal language right when you were saying uh that there were the the way that the ccc has been used previously created some like flexibility and and uh with the with this new flexibility uh and sort of a transition of power in the senate and house ag committees I, I worry about the kind of balance of power and, and how the kind of executive takes over or, or keeps growing relative to sort of the legislative aspect of policymaking. Alex, are we going to get into a separation of power question here? Is that where I, we're headed? Well, that was, uh, there was no question. I just, <laughs> yeah, I think so here's, it's a, he, he does own your book. So, uh, <laughs> oh, oh gosh, I was hoping we'd make through one discussion without that coming up. Um, uh, so here's, here's, it does raise some concerns, right? But the CCC is itself statutory. 
it was it was it's 1948 so it's it's old it's a little a little more flexible than what we think of stat what statutes look like today but also um the appropriators have a pretty tight role to play in this because like i said it's a bar so one of the things that makes the ccc so fascinating within the realm of the federal system and and like somebody throw up a, a warning flag if i'm getting into geek geek territory on this stuff but the ccc is a direct borrowing authority on the treasury there are not many of those in the federal system i mean it is usda through that that operation borrows directly uh, on the full faith and credit of the united states that's a that's just an incredible authority but to make it work congressional appropriators have to have to basically pay off the credit card right so in any situation the appropriators are going to have a pretty large role in that and so i do think I do think it, it, there are there are very good theoretical sort of separation of powers questions on it. Sorry, my kids are uh, you could man in the background. Um, That's all right. There are kids in the background here too. It's just a different type <laughs> of noise. <laughs> this is the one good thing about the virtual world, right? We've all been humanized. We're we're, we're all uh, that's true. We all realize that that we're human <laughs> beings that have lives around us. Uh, anyway, so you have to. There are separation issues, but largely you've got. Uh, you've got to work closely with the appropriators because if they decide um, and if they decide they don't like what's going on, they can shut things down quickly. And if, if you watch secretary Vilsack's nomination hearing, he mentioned this to uh, uh, Senator Hoven, who is the ranking member on the ag Probe subcommittee in the Senate to say, look, that you guys gave the previous secretary some real leeway. Let us work through some things as well. So Alex, I, I think that there is reason to see a more functional interbranch working around this, if they, if everybody wants to, to play that role. Now, I also don't want to sound uh, Pollyannish, you know, and, and naive about this. There's going to be some real clashes. Well, but, but so you you, made, knows, you brought up an interesting name here, Vilsack, right? So yes. so like like this isn't like a like a new person to this role. Like this is somebody that technically should have some idea of what's going on. Uh, inside and out before they make any of these monumental changes to to this this I don't know new direction for ag policy. Um, does does that feel like like Vilsack is is willing to step into a more novel role, or are we expecting more business as usual? I think I got to be careful here. You can really get myself in trouble, right? Um, I think Secretary Vilsack clearly tons of experience and knowledge. I mean, it was kind of funny, right? We're doing agency review and we didn't know it. He's like, we're not on the personnel side. So we don't know who's going to be what. You just get all the rumors, you know? And then, then he gets named and you kind of laugh and like, oh my gosh. So one, that makes agency 101 a little bit easier, but it makes state of the agency much harder because he know like you can't, not that anybody would ever bury something deep in a footnote, but he reads every word, every page. Like there are no... There are no end of memo kind of things. And so it kind of shifted our, our review a little bit to be much more focused on here's what it was when you left. You know, here's the state of the agency four years later kind of thing. But Trey, to your point, he's, he's going to understand those dynamics really well. He's worked with, Hoven, with Senator Hoven, with um, Chairwoman Stabenow and others. So I think there's a lot of knowledge. And I, I presume that's one of the main reasons why you know, he was asked to do it again is you, you're putting it in trusted hands. And um, I would take that as a signal of the role that, that USDA will play in these larger climate discussions within the administration, that it puts um, Secretary Vilsack in a good place to deal with Congress because he has, he has longstanding relationships okay. and, is, and is able to do so. Okay, so I, I, I kind of want to double down on the Vilsack conversation because that, that was like a very contentious conversation there for a while as to, to who should be this next uh, person to run this hyper important organization that isn't just about farmers, you know, and, and uh, right. so do you feel like, or do you get the sense that, um, that we can maybe anticipate some unique steps relative to what even the Obama administration was focusing on? Obviously climate is a big part, but, but I mean, we also have snap conversations that are ongoing um, you know, we, we have uh, these trade conflicts that are still ongoing. 
Uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it's, you can't go back to business as usual in 2008 anymore. There, there has to be something that changes. But, or are we trying to go back to 2008? The easy answer to that is no, we're not. I don't think anybody's trying to go back to 08. And I think, um, I think he said it in the nomination hearing pretty clearly. He's not the same person. It's not the same agency as it was four years ago when he left. And I think you add on to that. We're not, we're not in the same place we were politically as a society. I mean, if you need any uh, more brutal and, and awful of an example, you've got January 6th staring us still in the, in the face. We've got a second impeachment of the previous president uh, starting next week. So I think there is a, um, I think it's safe to say that nobody, they're not, they're not sort of going back in to start uh, using a kind of status quo ante, right? Like we're, we're not going back to that kind of place. It is very much a um, learned and lived experience from what we've seen. And I'll, I'll just put one, you know, one finer point on that. The, 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 way, the way morale has shifted. So you mentioned ERS. The way the previous administration treated in incredibly important and valuable parts of that agency and that department, um, you don't just step back in and you know those four years disappear. There's going to have to be a whole effort of morale and rebuilding and and sort of trying to get back, um, trying to get a functioning set of agencies in the department back. Um, I think there's a tough sort of lesson in the importance of leadership. You know, we we make fun of government and, and political people. But political leadership in the agencies really matters um, because it really does uh, filter through the agencies and people respond and react. And he's in, he's going back into a place that's changed uh, from what it was when he left. And I think that's well, a tough reality, so, but it's an important one. So, so on the Ag Econ side, obviously, we all know about the ERS move and, and what that did and how that looked. Uh, but just for context, for people that are listening, um, there was this kind of unprecedented change that happened at the USDA on the ag econ side where all of a sudden our kind of compatriots that were in uh, DC were kind of pushed into Kansas City, which I love Kansas City. Uh, the Chiefs playing the Super Bowl this weekend. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. I love it. But I get that not everybody wants to be in Kansas City over DC. And so that that move was not ideal. Uh, at only least like, the way that it was implemented. only like two and a half people went right. They yeah, and, and we lost a brain. lot of people. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and it, and that's a good example of this sort of thing, right? That it isn't just the move to Kansas City; it's the way it was signaled, the way it was done, and what it meant to everybody there. Um, yeah. right? it, it's one thing to maybe have to transition to another city over time. It's another thing to basically communicate to the agency you want to break it, and we don't care. And that. That was that's just that's tough and that's just not the way to run things. Um, and I think it's going to be a difficult thing to get back up and running to full capacity. So, but, so this is this is deep tracks. But like you wrote a, an article a while back that was very much like an old school institutional economics article about like like the role of of how like these contracts and you know trust plays out. And in, in, uh, it was a farm doc article. I, I'm I'm drawing a blank on what it was called. Uh, I. I four people sent me that article um because because i mean it was very much a legal article but but it, it had a lot of kind of kind of meat in there about like how how you treat these relationships or how you treat the the future of these institutions um that that i i, I do wonder about like where we go forward from here when so much of the that institutional connection between ers and congress for example it has been kind of on on the rocks uh, there for a while. And I, I have that question writ large, uh, particularly yeah. after what we've seen uh, the last four years and what we've seen just in the last month or so, uh, or I mean, almost a month to the day now uh, with the January 6th events. It is difficult. Uh, it is, I mean, President Biden has a huge task in front of him to rebuild trust around the government, around um, the political discussions we have, how we talk to each other and, and, and how we work through. I mean, we, we've, we've managed to take disagreement and make it like it's this awful thing that has to be a, a complete war when disagreement's the whole point. I mean, it's sort of, you can't have politics without disagreeing. You can't, you can't write policy without having to negotiate and compromise through disagreements in good faith. And so without that, you just, 
it doesn't function. A system self-government, frankly, doesn't work. So we got a lot of rebuilding to do, of which the ERS and IFA stuff is like one small category of that, right? It's one. Uh, it's is, one I'm, I'm listening to you, but but this is this is Jim Hilker. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> that was so rude, Trey. I, I'm sorry. He just was Jonathan like, was he, like bringing it home, preaching. No, man, you had to pull and me out. Just, that was exactly what has to happen. Middle finger, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> no, it's just, he's, so, I, I don't know if you've ever met Jim, but he does Jim like, like he's hyper energetic. So he was like jumping and like waving his hands. So I, I, was, uh, I thought <laughs> that's but, exactly uh, how that happened. You had to pull me out of that. I was, we, we were getting no one. Awesome. We're Tail's never going to get so Jonathan <laughs> to talk to us again. <laughs> next time i want to be on the slope that's how it's <laughs> you're welcome anytime up. anytime you want to come up come give a talk and then and then we'll go skiing uh <laughs> deal we we can make that is you got it you got it so I, <laughs> let me i i've got i've got just a, a more broad question give us some good news can you can you like i mean obviously you know farm financials are looking great right now uh but but there's still concern about the future um and uh you know, obviously these agricultural economy is becoming maybe more political uh, over the last, we'll call it 10 years, but really four, especially. Um, where, what, what, is, what is the good news? Is, is there anything on the horizon that, that you feel like is, you know, positive? <laughs> I mean, I try to, I can be a dark cloud person uh, quite often, yeah. but I, I try to find a ray of light here or there, right? The, look, the, if you, the good news is while we went through quite a bit, it isn't, you know, it's resilient. I mean, I'm still amazed. If you think back to where we were just a little, not quite a year ago when COVID first like blew everything up, right? And, or melted the world down, as you said. And, you know, we're worried at that point in time, like can the supply chains even, you know, are we gonna be able to get food? You have people making runs yeah. in the grocery stores. We've, we've adjusted pretty well. Now, it is certainly indicated there's a lot of work to do make us more resilient in our food system to make us more competitive and functional and things like that right there's there it's highlighted the need for work but i i take away from this that, that we we've come through and we can tackle big issues i mean i you know watching the rate of vaccination for example sure uh, we're moving we're moving in the right direction is it fast enough? Probably not. Do I want my kids back in school and not trying to learn from the living room and interrupting Zoom meetings that I have? Important. It was a great stiff arm, computers? though, man. You, that was, was a classic <laughs> stiff arm. <laughs> Nine-year-old okay. boys and, and puppies in a pandemic are 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 a special undertaking. Uh, by well, well, so so let me get personal. Like I, so when when all of the world felt like everything was changing and then we had the election. Uh, I talked to my little brother and I was like, you know, he, he, he's a John Deere tech in very rural Kansas. Um, and I was like, you know, we, we got it. Something's got to change here. Uh, yeah. Like, wh what are we going to do here? Um, and, and he made the comment that, that we're fighting for our way of life because somebody's going to change our way of life. Uh, that, that like farm policy is going to change from, and he's a, he's a young kid, but th that's what the people are saying in rural America in certain parts. Where, where they're concerned that ag policy is going to change in a way that's that's going to destroy this uh, I don't know historic you know family farm that uh, that that we've maintained for so long. Um, is there anything on the horizon? Is that obviously I, I personally I think that's that's way overselling the changes that are likely to happen. But but I, I it would be comforting to hear it from somebody that isn't me. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, look, I don't think change is a bad thing. Um, and yeah. I think farmers have been changing and adapting and, and uh, improving resilience for quite a while. And so I don't see it as a threat. Like I see, I do genuinely see it as a, as a, as an opportunity and as a chance to, uh, to adapt and adjust to things. And I think that's the only way it works. Otherwise, you know, you're stuck. And, and so but look, I think at the same time, it does mean that some people maybe who have gotten comfortable with one system in one way might have to start doing some different things. Um, it may be that payments don't just roll out because of a of a tweet, um, which is what we saw with MFP. I mean, those payments were, yeah. were, were nothing more than a political sort of response that the president at the time had 
and he's, he kicked it off by tweeting about it. So we may not see that kind of thing, hopefully, ever again. Um, you know, it may be that payments are going to be more tied to practices and things on the land and, and a return. You know, I made this, I made, you talk about, I made my brother mad about a year or so ago when I made some comment about, this was pre, pre that, you know, at some point the, the, the challenge for farm policy is that it is a smaller and smaller group of people receiving lar this larger chunk of money. And that's still taxpayer funded payments. It may be borrowing authority by the CCC, but those are taxpayer dollars. And, and at some point you're starting to get more and more of this question of uh, what's the value? What's the return on that investment from the taxpayer? And this is where the climate discussion has real opportunity. Mm. We can return value to the taxpayer by pulling carbon out of the, in, out of the air and, and putting it in its soils and helping with climate change. Will it take some more work? Yes, it's, you know, cover cropping is a, is, is a different type of farming, but it can be done. And so we've adapted, farmers have adapted forever. This is, that's, that's how agriculture continues to be successful as it adapts to the changes around it. So I'm confident that farmers can adapt, that the policy can adapt and that there will be new opportunities. Um, but again, that's probably cold comfort to somebody that, you know, really liked MFP. I, I don't think yeah. you see another well, MFP again. How about me? I didn't particularly like MFP, but I'm so tired of things happening. You know what I mean? You're talking about these great big opportunities. <laughs> yes. It would be nice just to have a couple months or years of freaking peace and quiet. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> but, you know, know, maybe man. we see maybe we see a more sane. I think we're going to definitely see less of this sort of uh, policy by tweet and policy by just massive reactionary. I do think you see somebody like, like President Biden and somebody like Vilsack. These are very experienced leaders um, who will work through things and not just sort of respond and react. And I do hope that. Even if you disagree with them politically or ideologically, I do hope that turns the temperature down for at least the bulk of people. There's going to be a, a, a subset that are unfortunately just not changing that behavior. I have them all on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, um, I, I, I'm afraid to know. So I do, I do think there's some, some potential there. Well, yeah, I, I, I think... So the, the two, I think the two groups that, that I hear the most conversation from is a conversation about changes in tax policy, that, uh, that, that there is that fear that there's going to be some, some massive shift in tax policy that's going to destroy the Centennial Farm. Um, and then there's the second conversation that I hear that's a, a concern about trade policy, that, that we've, been, we've been on this direction for four years, I guess, well, three and a half years, where we really... We're trying to, to get ahead of this trade conflict and, and it turned into a European conflict and all the other conflicts. But, but like we, we are now in this place where, you know, people are almost expecting the MFPs or they're, they're expecting some type of, I don't know, uh, someone to make them whole for all of the bad things that have been happening in, in trade relationships. And our, obviously China is buying a lot of things right now. So, so like, you know, there might be some, some comfort there, but I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a pass on tax discussion because uh, okay. that I tried to avoid that in law school, that class. Um, <laughs> the, um, the trade one does have me concerned and I'll just, you know, what, what we saw here again, we see this example of, of the lack of strategy. And I've had some people yell at me for saying this, but I'm just going to say it again. Like there was no strategy in what went on with the tariffs and the issues with China and trade in the previous administration. Um, and I am concerned that they've left uh, a smoldering pile of problems um, to the new administration. So China is a great example. Any, any trade expert, anybody that does this stuff, and I, I've skimmed across the top, so I don't claim real expertise on this, but what I hear um, and what I have heard is that First off, this whole phased trade, like this is not the way trade negotiations typically happen. Now, that could be a good thing because we've got a lot of concerns and problems with how trade has been has been negotiated in the past. But I look at China phase one and, and as you know, a, a recovering attorney, I think 
there isn't a single enforceable provision in that phase one. Mm. I'm kind of amazed that anybody pushed that through without any, like anything that can enforce it. If you look at it and read it, the whole thing is basically built on, well, if we don't do what we, first of all, we have a big out, there has to be the market justification for buying. If we take that out and you don't want, and you disagree with it, the only response is, well, elevate it to the next level in the Chinese political system and let them deal with it. I mean, it's just one of these things that is sort of shocking. How we come back from that, I don't know. Um, mm. What, you know, what the next phase or round or well, attempt at, at resetting trade negotiations, I think is a big concern. What I throw in there, sorry, Alex, what I do yeah. throw in there is that what we've been, condi- what has been too much of a condition in the last couple of years is this idea that we get payments out before we even know there's damage. Every ad hoc program, every farm program, everything pays in arrears, right? Once we know there's been a loss, so crop insurance pays after you've adjusted the loss. So people will have to, to adjust to that. The idea of front loading payments before we even know there's, there's damage, that was irresponsible. Well, how about, so, so China is a big problem, but some of them seem simple to me in that let's just take away those steel and aluminum tariffs. And doesn't that part of the trade war just go? I don't know, because again, you don't, you don't go back to the status quo ante, right? You never, you never unscramble the egg. I'm trying to think of another, another genie doesn't go back in the bottle, whatever, whatever the the metaphor is. So you don't, and this is one of the things we were saying um, early on with the tariff conflict. If you look at history, and my favorite historical sort of story analog on this is the uh, is the anchovy mess in the in like 1972, when the old anchovy uh, mess. Oh, classic. Peru, that's this that's is, a Jim Hilker comment. He was like one time he came on. He was like, "Oh, the Russian wheat scandal of blah blah blah." <laughs> and we're like, yeah. "What are you talking about?" That one I do know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, in 72, uh, Nixon put an embargo on soybeans. It was like three or four month embargo on soybeans because. Hold on a minute. Weird historical moment. An El Nino event destroyed the anchovy harvest in Peru, and there was a run on protein for feed. And so they ran soybean prices up, and Nixon freaks out, slaps an embargo. At that point in time, like Japan, like 99% or 95% of Japan's protein and soybean need came from the United States. In response to that, a few years later, they started investing hundreds of millions of dollars in Brazilian soybean production. Mm. Right? So there's never... These sort of weird things, these little events have this kind of ripple effect through time because everybody has a reason to respond and react around it. So you don't get a start over. We don't yeah, get to go back. From a policy perspective, you do. I get it that it's going to mess up trade flows for a long time. And now Brazil's got a ton of soybeans planted that they didn't have before. But the seems like from a yeah, policy perspective, burn. well, yeah, from a policy perspective, it seems pretty simple. Uh, just zero out those suckers. <laughs> I mean, I think the tar- I, particularly the the more egregious tariffs. I mean, I got to believe they pull those down or get back out of that because you've got. And my favorite still is the the Canadian. What we used a national security issue against Canada on aluminum. I mean, that's mm, that's that, uh, they have scary aluminum. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. but they certainly it's hard to it's hard to think of Canada as a national security threat uh, to our to America. Uh, here in Michigan, I don't know. They drink a lot of beer, and you never know what's going to happen with the Canadians. But I, that's true. I, there could be a I, run uh, on the on the aluminum cans. But. Well, yeah. <laughs> which, which honestly, like I do a lot of craft beer research, and this aluminum conversation has been a thing for four years. Um, so, and that's the weird thing about the the wrinkles you're talking about with anchovies. You don't think about the industries that that end up being impacted by this stuff until yeah. it's too late. Um, and, uh, and so, what reputation, what reputation yeah, damage means. Sure. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if economists have like, I mean, I know we have like the value of a person's life. Is there a value of reputational damage? There has to be because we sue over it, right? I mean, yeah. There has to be I, some it, sort of reputational. economists do it all the time. I, I don't yeah. know. Al, yeah, Alex would be the lawyer that would sue you about it. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can hear you right now. <laughs> still on the line i don't know alex he's destroyed my reputation he just gives me crap all the time so i i don't know uh but the i i, I think that you know here in michigan we have a lot of trade conversations that, that weren't even related to the trade war 
Uh, you know, so, so tart cherries are a big thing. I'm, I'm in Northern Michigan. That's a thing that you could walk into any bar in Northern Michigan a year about the tart cherry conflicts. Um, and, and so like, I, I kind of wonder, like, if you look at the history of trade policy, right, you go back to like Cordell Hall and like, like how crazy it was that we started even pushing toward free trade. Are we done with that? <laughs> as, as society moved past free trade or, or, or are we still thinking that we're going to start making these trade relationships work? I, that is a question I, I, I mean, I have no great insights on that, but I do think you got more than we, I do. <laughs> if we have, if we haven't learned the damage that it does to society, like Michigan, a good example, Ohio, you know, my hometown where what, what manufacturing used to be there is, is long left the country sure. and what it leaves behind in these communities, rural communities, manufacturing areas, I would I would hope we've learned that we have to reevaluate the way in which we think about trade and what it means, hmm. not just the big picture, but what it means in towns and congressional districts and how that, re, how that plays back through the political system where we get to some of the things we've seen recently. I have no idea whether we have learned that or, and what, what a future trade agreement negotiation or concept looks like. That, I await, I await the wisdom of others to, uh, bring that one down but i gotta believe it's we've i've got to believe we've had a shock enough of a shock to the system or a series of shocks to the system to force rethinking around these things well here's hoping that the shock to the system won't kill it so uh, <laughs> <laughs> i well, really well appreciate you coming on man uh this has been really good it's been hey, awesome. this is this has been the most enjoyable this is a great this is fun <laughs> And I tell you, I'm, I've got it. We've got it recorded. So it's in the, it's, it's in the ether. And I get that the next one I'm on the slope. So we have this. We have this You're in man. When, when we can have, when we can have <laughs> guest speakers again, you'll come up. It's so cheap to ski up here and the resorts are not bad. So, you know, uh, Betty Ford used to ski all the time here. So, so if, if it's good enough for Betty Ford, it's probably good enough for you. But I oh, I'm a horrible <laughs> skier. I'll be lucky to come away without broken bones or a, or a functional system. But I, I appreciate it. It's great meeting and having you guys having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, man. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Take, Take care. care.